Hi, this is the overview video for Chapter 4, Motion in 2 and 3 Dimensions. This is the second chapter in kinematics. In Chapter 3, we covered kinematics formulas in 1D. And in this chapter, we bring in additional dimensions. And uh, in the context of this class, most of the problems we work with will be in two dimensions. Um, later on, when we do rigid body rotation, especially with angular momentum, we'll have to bring in third dimension. But most of the times, even when the motion is actually three-dimensional, you can usually pick a plane where all the interesting things happen and describe it adequately two-dimensionally. Um, so as long as we can do that, we'll do that. So even though the chapter says motion in two and three dimensions, we'll mostly concern ourselves with the motion in two dimensions. So as usual, I'll uh, go over the sections and describe uh, what's covered in lectures, what the uh, lecture doesn't cover, and uh, what I sometimes do differently uh, from the textbook. I think when, in kinematics, there isn't much that I do differently. So, um, so first, the section 4.1 displacement and velocity vectors. These should sound familiar. This is basically displacement and velocity we covered in chapter 3. Uh, what's new here is that we are bringing in these additional dimensions for y and z. And uh, using vector notation, you can um, uh, express it as r, position r vector which has components x, y, and z. Uh, one thing that I do do differently from textbook is textbook uses these unit vector notations, i hat, j hat, k hat. I prefer x hat, y hat, z hat. They, they are the same. It's just, uh, uh, I think it is i, j, k is an older notation. And I guess x hat, y hat, and z hat can be confusing with, you know, is it x the position or x hat the unit vector? And look for the hat. Hat is the thing that indicates whether something's a unit vector or not. Now, uh, you won't really see me use this uh, formal vector notation most of the semester. And um, I think that's appropriate for the level of our class. Uh, but do give this a section a read, because as you progress in your science and engineering education, um, you are going to use more of the formalism. The, so uh, you are going to use more of the formalism. So the earlier you get used to it, great, the better. <laughs> um, so the fact that I don't use these formal notations as much shouldn't discourage you from doing that. But so read through it um, and the three-dimensional axis. Get what you can out of it. Uh, you will have plenty of time to get used to the three-dimensional coordinate system um, as you progress in your education. Now, there was one thing from this section I want you to point out. Um, yeah, velocity vector, again, the same way we define it um, using derivative. Velocity vector is a derivative of the position vector. Hopefully all this sounds familiar after chapter 3. And, um, and I ha do have a vector description of motion lecture, but it's with uh, chapter 3 lectures. I, the, when I putting together the recorded lectures that made better sense. <laughs> so, well, let's see, ah, yeah. The independence of uh, perpendicular motions. And you could say this is uh, really the reason I don't uh, really lean on that formal notation too much. And um, you will see some demonstration of this independence of perpendicular motions with the uh, um, demo videos and the recorded lecture explanation of one of those demos. Um, so what this uh, tells you is that when you are writing down kinematics equations, you can write it down for x-axis, write it down for y-axis, and just to work them out separately, kind of ignoring the other perpendicular directions. So at our level, at least, there isn't really a need to write a single vector r that uh, contains both the x and y component. You can just uh, separate out the description of the vertical component of motion, 
description of the horizontal component of the motion and just uh, write them out as a number of equations. And in one of the later sections, there will be some description of the problem-solving strategy that you do use utilizing that fact. Okay, so that's it for section 4.1. Uh, section 4.2, acceleration vector. Same deal. Um, we define acceleration the way we did it in chapter 3 as the derivative of the velocity vector. Nothing's changed. The only thing that's changed is before the acceleration could be either parallel or anti-parallel to velocity. Now you got whole other world of choices. <laughs> so it, it could be perpendicular even. Um, so... So yeah, there's uh, lots of examples. Let's see here. Yeah, constant acceleration, uh, projectile motion under the acceleration due to gravity is so one very common example. And with the additional dimensions, one thing you are going to see is you're going to see the equations multiply. So in chapter three, we had four kinematics equations, which is what we derived here. Equation for position, velocity, um, Position again, oh, yeah, in terms of, I guess, writing this out. <laughs> and the, the V squared formula. Um, now, all of these for X component, you can write a version of it for the Y component. So you can see how equation 4.11 is related to equation 4.15. Just to replace X with Y. And same deal with the velocity, just to replace the X component with the Y component. So even though this uh, is technically eight equations, uh, it shouldn't feel like eight. It should really feel like only four equations because you are, um, whenever necessary, you are taking care to express it for all the relevant uh, dimensions. And uh, you will see a concrete example of that when we look at projectile motion. Uh, let's see what else is here. I think that's it. Yeah, so introduction of acceleration and kind of recap of kinematics formulas that were derived um, for constant acceleration back in chapter three. Now, projectile motion is the probably most common and definitely the most practical example that you will see as we cover kinematics because there's just so many examples of projectile motion. Basically, any time you can ignore the influence of air resistance and it involves something thrown, something flying, um, not literally flying like with wings, but, you know, basically thrown, um, then it can be treated as a projectile motion. This is, describes lots of sports, describes um, other applications, often military, <laughs> but... Uh, but like, uh, I guess satellite launch is not quite projectile motion, but th this is a, a, a really good example of an application of a multi-step uh, problem solving strategy. So um, like situations like this, and your textbook will describe up uh, before they get to the problem solving strategy. These are the kinematics equations as applied to the projectile motion. Now, in projectile motion, because you are saying it's under the influence of gravity alone, um, so acceleration in the y component is minus g, and this is the part that really simplifies it, x component of acceleration is zero. When you describe something as a projectile motion, you are explicitly saying uh, there's no other force other than gravity. So you ignore air resistance. So acceleration in the x component is zero. That simplifies your equations a lot. For the horizontal motion, that basically collapses your four equations down to two. Um, you have one that describes, well, or maybe even one. Um, you, your the equation for velocity is just a constant. Um, your, um, uh, I think they kind of flipped this around. Vx is equal to V initial x, doesn't change. And because your velocity is constant, your x equation is really simple. This initial position plus the movement due to that initial velocity. Um, your vertical motion, you still have four equations. These were basically the kinematics equations derived back in chapter three. So in most uh, projectile circumstances, these set of equations give you the tool to solve that situation for. 
um, identify the known quantities and use them to somehow figure out the unknown quantities. Now, as you are doing that, I mentioned this in one of the earlier lecture videos about physics problem solving, how it's like a lot of word problems in your math classes. And um, I'm told that a lot of students struggle with them. And um, so it's worth practicing. And I think some guidance in your practice is useful. Um, as far as the lecture goes, I do have a lot of examples of me solving projectile motion, and I do explain my steps step by step, and I hope they are useful. And I think uh, uh, one other resource that might be helpful to people who may be struggling is what your textbook mentions, problem solving strategy for projectile motion. You will see boxes like this throughout the textbook. And in fact, when we go into forces in the next week, uh, we introduce a set of problem solving strategies that we call standard strategy. Uh, we don't have anything quite as formalized when it comes to projectile motion other than to rely on two things, independence of the, the perpendicular directions of motion and um, to the fact that time is the common variable that connects the two independent directions of motion. Um, and I think that gets you a lot. Uh, all the rest is kind of practice. And especially as you're getting started, if you feel you are stuck, then these are the steps that I would uh, recommend that you try following. Uh, when you are first uh, faced with a situation, First, resolve the motion into the horizontal and vertical components um, along the x and y axis. And usually x would be horizontal, y will be vertical. And the main reason for that is uh, that independence of uh, the two perpendicular directions of motion. And two, the fact that for projectile motion, you know the accelerations along those two axes already. So breaking up the motion into those components should uh, um, start to give you some idea on how to solve the rest of the way. And uh, as you are doing that, treat the motion as basically one-dimensional motions. Um, you know, when you are looking at the X component, don't have to worry about the Y component. When you look at the Y component, don't have to worry about the X component. But sometimes you will want to connect the two. Like you want to figure out what happens as the projectile lands. In those cases, the common variable between the two mo motions is time. They both happen at the same time. And that will um, help you work out a lot of the scenarios. And then the, uh, this, is it, this one depends on what they ask. But I hope uh, having this uh, problem solving strategy step by step will give you some idea where to start, especially the first few questions that you try to work out in projectile motion. And this is a really long section, and I think the rest are basically examples. And I encourage you to read through the examples. Uh, with a problem solving like this, really not to, nothing beats practice. And by practice, I mean, you know, look at the example, look at the question statement, try to work it out on your own, and uh, maybe read the strategy. And then I would recommend trying it on your own for a while, like five minutes before you read through the solution. And if you worked it out, great. In, as you're reading through the solution, you can kind of double check. Uh, if you got stuck, then, you know, that is what the solution is for. I hope um, as you do that, it kind of, um, as you do that, it teaches you what you are missing when you are trying it on your own. So uh, this section has uh, lots of examples. Look at that. I also have a lot of recorded um, examples worked out. Look at that either uh, on the lecture page or as part of a homework help. Now, this section about the time of flight, trajectory, and range, I'll say two things about it. Um, like uh, every single section in the textbook, I think it's good for you to read it through, at least once. You know, look at the textbook approach, see how that works. That's one. Two, as far as your own problem solving goes, I don't think it's good for you to rely on these formulas. So as far as the formulas that they drive here goes, you know, time of flight or the range or the, I guess this is the height, maybe, um, or trajectory. Oh, oh, y is a function of x. I don't think we ever use that. These formulas, even the range formula, which might be more commonly used, 
my recommendation to you is forget they exist. And any question where this might be helpful, I recommend that you just to drive it yourself. Because doing that will give you a lot more practice in problem solving than just to using these derived formulas. You don't need that. I, I will never ask you a question where you must have memorized a range formula. I really want you to be able to just to work out the entire problem from first principles. Uh, you might rem memorize the kinematics equations if that helps you, although that's also not necessary, but memorizing kinematics equations, maybe. Memorizing range formula, I don't recommend it. I think, uh, if anything, it hurts your problem-solving practice. So I think uh, that's it for this section. Yeah, this is more about the orbit, which we won't get to <laughs> for a bit. And the chapter also covers uniform circular motion in section 4.4. And uh, the most important thing here is centripetal acceleration. I did record a couple lecture videos actually looking at this uh, textbook section. And what I will say is that, you know, do try to follow the derivation if that helps you. And I do think, uh, you know, read through every section at least once. Um, you don't necessarily have to understand everything. If uh, your eyes start to gl glaze over, skim over, skim it. Don't skip it, but, uh, you know read through it at least once without worrying about understanding everything. And at the end of the day, what I will say is the most important thing here is this formula. That is one <laughs> exception. The centripetal acceleration formula, V squared over R, you're going to be using it quite a bit uh, between this week and uh, later on, as we do forces, there will be situations where there's a centripetal force that uh, causes centripetal acceleration. And having this formula memorized will just uh, make your life easier. You won't have to come back to this section of textbook so many times to look this up. So the coverage of centripetal acceleration is probably the most important thing. I have other lecture videos to kind of illustrate this with the uh, um, simulation and um, I think once we get to forces, it'll be more natural. And equations of motion, you, we don't deal with this at all. Um, uh, because uh, we are going to be covering something very similar when we get to oscillations. So I, I don't think we need to worry about this now. So you might see a homework question or two. Other than that, um, I, I don't waste uh, a lot of time. Also, no uniform circular motion. You are going to see something like this eventually, but... For the time being, while we are dealing with the kinematics, we won't deal with any situations like this. I think that's uh, it for this section. And finally, section 4.5 is um, something that we more or less skip. I do think you have a homework question or two that deals with this relative motion and reference frames. Uh, when we get to forces, we'll talk about inertial reference frame briefly. And then um, we don't deal with it. Uh, I think for most people, kind of dealing with the relative motion like this is relatively intuitive. Uh, if it's not intuitive, then it still doesn't really affect you in this class. Um, but what this will be interesting for is for those of you going on to be physics majors, maybe you are going to be taking physics 4C. And when they cover special relativity, Calling back to this will be great. Um, so, so you know, if they might describe you, yes, to read it through the section. And I guess even if you are not taking physics 4C, read it, read it through every section at least once. Uh, but you don't have to worry too much about uh, what this section covers because we are basically skipping. So that's it for chapter four. Thank you for watching this to the end, and I will see you in other videos.